The National Broadcasting Company presents Eyes Aloft. Army Flash. One. Multimotor. High. Scene. Fifteen Joe Four. Overhead. Southeast. Eyes aloft, watching the sky, watching for planes flying the lane up above. Eyes aloft. Eyes aloft. The 4th Fighter Command of the United States Army Air Forces, in cooperation with West Coast radio stations, presents this series of Monday evening programs honoring the 150,000 volunteer observers and filter center workers whose round-the-clock vigilance keeps watchful guard of the Pacific Coast against attack by enemy planes. Eyes aloft. Night and day, we'll help protect the USA. Ken Carpenter speaking. Tonight, the fourth edition of Eyes Aloft, the gala program this evening, including the presentation of the handsome Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award to an outstanding filter center or observation post. Dramatized true stories from the home front. The Gordon Jenkins Orchestra and sportsmen give a musical salute to another branch of national defense. And you'll hear in person from a man and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Van Egan, formerly of Amsterdam, Holland. Here now, your Eyes Aloft narrator, a man who is helping Hollywood make educational films for the Army and Navy, the well-known newsreel commentator, Gain Whitman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let it be understood by those who care that a sinister and deadly evil is beginning to gnaw at the very heart of the Volunteer Ground Observer Corps. Beginning, yes. And there is time to stamp it out. We speak of the paid observer replacing the volunteer observer. In Washington, in Oregon, in California, isolated cases of the paid observer have cropped up. You who are responsible for conducting the great work of the Aircraft Warning Service must also serve as its physicians. You must recognize the diseases of morale and stamp them out before those diseases assume the proportions of plague. The practice of buying off one's patriotic duty must be blotted out in every case. In the beginning, it's all very insidious, apparently harmless, and seemingly the answer to a confronting obstacle. Here, in an imaginary case, the disease starts to attack something like this. Well, John, you shouldn't have accepted the responsibility as chief observer in this community if you didn't intend to carry through. Well, who says I'm not carrying it through? You just said you were ready to give up the whole thing. Well, I didn't mean it. How do you intend to get more people to help take watches? Now, who's that? Now, how do I know? Shall I take it, John? No, I'll get it. Hello? Yeah? Oh, George. What's wrong? He hasn't. Well, hang on a few minutes. I'll call and see what I can find out. If I can't locate him, I'll be right up myself. Okay, George, sorry. Can you see, Mary? Was that the post? Sure. Somebody hasn't shown up for a shift? Uh, it's a quarter after eight. Mace Copefield should have been there at eight to relieve George, relieve George Schaefer. What's the matter with Copefield? Oh, I don't know. He just hasn't shown up. Oh, brother, would I like to tell a few people off in this town? Too few are doing too much. And those that are are worn out. Farmers are into the second cutting of hay. They can't get labor. The pear and prune crops ripe, and they're trying to pick it shorthanded. Oh, I don't know what the answer is. Where are you going, John? I thought you were going to telephone Copeland. Oh, what's the use? He knows he had a shift tonight. You're going up to the post? Yeah. It's a watch till 1 a.m. I'll take it. This is the fourth you've taken this week. You shouldn't do it. Well, somebody has to keep the post going. Oh, well, I'll get my jacket and go up and sit with you. Oh, well, thanks, Mary. I'll, I'll appreciate it. Maybe you should tell this town what you think of it one of these days. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll lose my good disposition and do that someday. Come on, Mary, let's go. Such are the first symptoms. Observers fail to report for shifts. 
the conscientious volunteers begin doubling and tripling their own service. Chief observers begin to fear that they are personally falling down on a community job. Oh, Gain, may I interrupt for one moment? Certainly can. What is it? Well, so that there will be no misunderstanding whatsoever, may we explain that there are over 2,000 observation posts operating in the Pacific Coast area. Most of these posts are manned solely by volunteer civilian observers. However, because some areas are so remote or not populated or for similar reasons and must still be guarded just as any other area, then the Army has assigned observation work to forest service stations or, in a few isolated cases, the Coast Guard, Navy, and Army carry on. And in still rarer cases, paid employees who guard railway bridges or hydroelectric dams assume the role of observers. But the great heart, the very soul of the Ground Observer Corps, is the willing, patriotic, unpaid, civilian volunteer observer. And that's the only way the system can work successfully. That's the way it must be. After all, what true American wants to buy his way out of community and national responsibility? All right, Gain. Now, let's return to the devastating problem which confronts our mythical chief observer. He and his wife have gone out in the night to make their way to the post. Ooh, it's chilly tonight. I think we'll have an early fall. Mind the step here, Mary. Yes. Oh, come in, John. Hello, Mary. Hello, Hi, there. George. I'm sorry about you getting stuck like this, George. Oh, that's all right. It's happened before, and I've lived through it. Can you call Miss Copeland, John? No, I didn't. We'll take the watch. Oh, now, John, Mary. Wait a second, quiet. What? Open the door. Clean. Uh, can you see it? No, oh, just his riding lights. Single motor heading east. I'll get it. It's a good thing somebody was here. Oh, don't worry. I wouldn't have left till somebody showed up to relieve me. First plane over here this week, and Mace Copeland isn't here to have the honor of repairing. Army flash. One. Single. Low. Heard. Angeles 51. Overhead. East. <laughs> you know, it makes a fellow feel important to be calling right in direct to the United States Army about these things, doesn't it? More people ought to feel that way about it. Uh, I'm pretty discouraged tonight, George. I don't think I'm doing a good job as chief observer. Oh, now, now, sit down. I want to tell you about a plan I figured out tonight. See what you think of it. Well, I'm going to sit here by the stove. Thank you, I'm getting to the point where I'd like to tell every slacker in this town what I think. Well, that won't help you any. I'm tired of begging them to help. Every other town in this whole county has well-manned observation posts. Look at ours. Well, there's only a couple of hundred people in our burg, John. Yes, and only 23 of them helping to run this post. It irritates me so when I hear people laugh and say, Oh, the Japs will never come and bob Midvale. Yeah. Don't they know they're only part of a big system? Don't they know the world is bigger than just Midvale? Oh, you're upset tonight, John. Yes, I am upset. And by thunder, I, I got a notion to go up to that lumber mill at noontime tomorrow and give those mill workers a little stump speech. Now, you get in trouble. Uh, now, listen, John. Here's my idea, and I think it might work. Uh, oh, what is it? Well, uh, the women are keeping the daytime shift pretty well manned. It's the night shifts that are hard to keep filled. Uh, you're telling me. Well, now, during harvest season, some of the men are working awful hours trying to get their work done. Uh, don't I know it? Uh, you know that Mrs. Ibbett who lives on the edge of town with her two kids? Yeah. She's a widow, and she's been on relief since she came here. Oh, what about her? Well, why couldn't us observers all chip in, say, 50 cents a month and hire Mrs. Ibbett to take over the night watches? Help her, and at the same time, help us. Hey, not bad. Well, that's a wonderful idea, George. <laughs> but wait. There are only 23 observers. Even if we all put in a dollar a month, that's only $23. Mrs. Zibbett wouldn't work for that. Uh, well, the whole town ought to be asked to contribute. By thunder, I know what I'm going to do. Now, John, please. I will go up to that sawmill tomorrow noon. I'll ask those men, as long as they aren't putting in any time as observers, to hand out a little money regularly. Now, look, I'll John, tell them what I think of their attitude. <laughs> such an easy way to solve the problem. Pay somebody to handle the watches. But what a black mark on a community fully capable of manning a post. Did they realize they were making a mercenary of Mrs. Hibbert and making of themselves dollar, no four-bit patriots? True enough, they were sincere, but they were also short-sighted. So next day, well-meaning, blundering John went to the mill at noon, turned into a stump speaker, pouring out the things that were in his heart. Some of the more rowdy transient workers openly laughed at it. Made for our home. We're doing this work for the army, for America. I'll vote for you, brother. <laughs> oh, shut up. Let John say what he wants. Go on, John. I'm getting 
head and sore now. Some of you are laughing at what I'm trying to tell you. Well, when I look at your faces, I can pick you out. One by one. A year ago, those of you who are ridiculing me now were on relief. Taking money from the government. Yes, and people like me were paying their way. Now the nation's at war. The mill is open, going strong and paying your big wages. And you're spending your money like water. When the war is over, you'll be broke again. Yes, sir, I mean, like myself, I'll have to go back to support me again. Why don't you hire a hole? You birds have no community spirit, no national loyalty. What do you want us to do? Go around wave a flag? Yeah. No! I want you to spend some of your time to share the job of running our local observation post. Now, when do you think the Japs are coming to bomb midway? <laughs> Give the man a chance. What do you want, John? Since you birds won't put in your time, will you put in a few dollars of your money to help pay to hire a regular nighttime observer? Come on, boys. Here's a hat. Pass it around. Drop in your contribution. Come on. Come on, put something in. Well, you can't buy this sort of thing any more than you can buy the loyalty of a soldier. The community who fails to look upon the aircraft warning service as an honorable, worthwhile venture, a link in home protection, is indeed a sad-thinking community. No, you can't buy love for country any more than you can buy mother love. There must be an intense, burning community spirit to carry on this work on the 100% volunteer basis, or the observation post in that location is destined for failure. By experience, this is what invariably happens. The first month. Bill, we're hiring Mrs. Ibbett as a paid observer for night watches. You won't have to take a shift anymore if you'll give me 50 cents a month. Say, say, that's great. Keep the post running and I get my sleep besides. Uh, 50 cents a month, you say? Oh, well, that's wonderful. I'll go for that idea. <laughs> Here you are, John. Uh, four bits. <laughs> Second month that the community has a paid observer. How about 50 cents, Bill? Huh? 50 cents? For what? You know, the woman we're hiring as observer. Huh? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Here. Say, how long is this thing going on anyway? History of the few such cases of paid observers that exist shows this community attitude the third month. Well, Bill, I'm back again. First of the month, four bits, please. Oh, now, look, John. I don't see why I should keep on dishing out. Why doesn't everybody? Why didn't everybody help with the watcher ship? Well, that's different, but I don't want to keep on shelling out four bits a month forever. Uh, you better just count me out from now on. Okay, Bill, whatever you say. You're the fifth person who's told me that this month. Okay, Bill, we'll count you out. What seemed to be a good idea turned out to be a bad one. Community morale was destroyed. Because of apathy, disinterest, bad management, the post failed. Every post that has resorted to the paid observer method is eventually destined to become a weak and inefficient link in the volunteer civilian army that protects the Pacific coast from a possible invasion by enemy planes. Of the several thousand posts in this area, fortunately, there are only a few which have resorted to the paid observer system. Those few must be stamped out before the disease spreads. To be maintained successfully, the aircraft warning service must come as a free contribution of service, right from the hearts of the people. May the watch cry ever be, eyes aloft. Each week, the Gordon Jenkins Orchestra and the Sportsman present our stirring aircraft warning service theme song, Eyes Aloft, in medley with the official fighting song of some military force. And this week, we turn to our United Nations ally, Australia. We join thrilling eyes aloft with the song of the Australian Army, Waltzing Matilda. Was once the sentinel's cry, but a modern 20th century fall repair must watch the sky. Eyes aloft, night and day, we'll help protect the USA. Once a 
jolly swagman can't buy a billabong Under the shade of the cooler bar tree And he sang as he watched and waited till his billy boy You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me And he sang as he watched and waited till his billy boy You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me once a jolly swagman can't buy a billabong Under the shade of the cooler bar tree And he sang as he watched and waited till his billy boy You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me And he sang as he watched and waited till his billy boy You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me Come a waltzing Matilda with me. What if I land and two if I see? Well, at once the sentinels cry. For the modern 20th century, Paul Revere must watch the sky. Eyes along, night and day. The feature of our show, growing in popularity, is the McKinley Diary. The centrally located McKinley, Oregon Post seems to typify the true spirit of the Ground Observer Corps. The distant drone of a small sawmill finds its way down from out of the hills. And the drone loses itself among the trees of the Green Valley Hollow. There is the distant lowing of cattle the call of a bawling calf to its mother across the pasture. An auto shatters tread-worn tires along the dusty gravel road that bends through the little valley. A tan-faced observer quietly sits in an old chair leaned back against the outside of the unpainted little frame shack that squats beneath the great old cherry tree. His ears have heard the drone of the sawmill, and the bawl of the calf, and the whir of the passing motor car. But they are not sounds to concern him for he is attuned to hear only the approaching whine of an airplane. Though the vigil is never broken, few planes are ever seen over McKinley Post. To while away the long hours, watchers record it in their diary. Each week, we read one or two brief entries, word for word, just as they were written by McKinley Post observers. Here now, let's turn to some page at random. June 7th, Sunday just returned from the funeral of Cookie, Jerry's classmate and pal. I shall miss his cheerful face and quaint sayings if I drive the children to and from school this year as I did last. Mabel O'Sullivan. And over here on the next page, June 8th, Monday. A new page and a new day for us here in the peace and quiet of our homes. But there are other very sad events not caused by war, but strike in our midst. I am taking the watch today in the place of Mrs. Cook, one of our most faithful watchers. She has just lost one of the most precious treasures given her by God. Cookie has been taken home by him to dwell forever in the land of happiness and peace. This is a little poem I've written tonight while on duty. I dedicate it to a dear little boy who has now gone away. Your little friends will miss you when back to school they go. They'll miss your smile, your face so fair. For Cookie won't be there. His desk is empty. His books are gone. But his words and smiles still linger on. And from above, an angel fair whispers, Fear not, for Cookie will be there. And when you gather in the playground beyond the shining blue, you'll find the loving master waiting there to welcome you. A look around that classroom at shining faces there. And in the midst of all that group, cook.
Kentucky, will you be there? Mildred King. Ken Carpenter to talk with a man and a woman who have come to make America their new home. The gentleman, a well-known lecturer, writer, and newspaper correspondent of Amsterdam, Holland. Meet Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Van Egan. How long have you and Mrs. Van Egan been in America, sir? We arrived in New York in 1939. Yes, this coming November, we will proudly celebrate our third year in this wonderful country. 1939? Well, then, were you people in Holland when war broke out? No, Mrs. Van Egan and I were in France. I was in that country at the time, gathering material for a series of articles for the Amsterdam newspaper, The Telegraph. Oh, I see. Elsus and I were in Paris when Germany attacked France. Yes, we saw Paris experience her first blackout. Well, uh, how long did you stay in France after the outbreak of the war, Mrs. Van Egan? We left at once for our homeland. You see, my husband was an executive member of the Netherlands Red Cross Committee, and he felt that he would be needed. I am sorry to say that my fears were not completely shared by Hollanders in general. Few seemed to feel that Hitler would ever attack the Low Countries. Uh, what did you do after you got home to Amsterdam? A newspaper commissioned me to go to America and write a series of articles about the American war attitude. After Mrs. Van Egan and I arrived here and traveled about, we found ourselves in love with America and its people. Uh, where were you when America entered the war? Visiting friends in Encinitas, California. I was writing a book at the time, but when war broke out, my wife and I decided that writing should be secondary, that we must spend our every effort in trying to assist the nation we had grown to admire and respect. Well, that's, that's fine, but you're both Hollanders. We have both taken out our first citizen papers now. Oh, well, I didn't know. That's splendid. We both went right to work, Mr. Carpenter, in the community that had accepted us. From last February on, we have shared the work as ground observers at the Lucadia Post. Three months ago, I was pleased at being asked to organize the local Encinitas rationing board. That takes six days a week, but I still have time to continue serving as an aircraft warning service observer. Alfred and I intend to help all we can, as long as we are needed, in all of America's war efforts. Well, more people should have the same appreciation and interest in doing for our nation at this time. Now, one thing, Mr. Van Egan, do you know anything about any aircraft warning service that Holland might have had? Well, in poor Holland, at the outbreak of the war, the Dutch army had an unorganized skeleton aircraft warning service. Yes. If Holland had been awake and prepared as America is today, the story might have been different. Yes, Holland lost pretty quickly, didn't she? Mr. Carpenter, Holland lost in the first half hour of its war with Hitler. Germans made a surprise attack at 4 a.m. 30 minutes later, the entire Dutch air fleet in Holland had been paralyzed. Uh, that's fast work, horrible work. That's why Americans must keep our volunteer civilian aircraft warning service in constant operation. When and if the Japs ever come, this country will be prepared. America's fighting planes will be warned in time, they will be in the air to defend this nation. Well, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Van Egan. Our last true life story for today comes from an observation post in Grays Harbor County in the state of Washington. The post is located in the center of the picturesque town of Hump Tulips on the Olympic Peninsula. Early this summer, an amazing incident happened there. It proved the courage of the observers who operate Hump Tulips Post. Mid-afternoon, two watchers, Mrs. Eleanor Randall and Mrs. A.K. Harris, were on duty. Miss Kraft was just arriving to relieve them. Well, I'm here, lady. Yes, we saw you coming, Marjorie. You're ten minutes early. How are you, Mrs. Oh, Harris? Fine, yes, Randall. We're fine. Did you get to report any planes this watch? No, we were just looking at the logbook. Hasn't been a plane reported from our post since last Friday. Well, I think I'll go on home. Stop in at the store and get a few chops for dinner. You coming now, Mrs. Harris? Thank you. Wait a minute. Don't I hear something? You mean a plane? It's quiet. Listen. I'm going out and look. I do hear a plane. There it is. 
It's flying low. Well, come in and report it. I think there's something wrong with its motor. Here? What? Say, I never saw a plane like that before. It does look strange. It's a fine motor. I'll report it right away. You people keep your eyes on it. Yes, we will. I think it's going to land somewhere over back in there. Oh, hello. Uh, Army Flash. One, by motor, low, seen, Aberdeen, 124, northwest. Well, can you see... Oh, my heavens, do you see that? Something fell out of it. It's a man. There, look. See his parachute opened. There's another one. And there's another one. I'll bet this is what we've been watching for. A Jap attack by air. Well, if it is, those paratroopers have probably got machine guns and bombs and everything to attack with. Oh, my We've got to do something. Oh, oh dear. I see a man anywhere on the street. Oh, oh, we've got like that. I thought I saw your husband go in the store down the street. Oh, oh, let's go. Well, get him. Somebody has to stay here and keep the post in operation in case of oh, trouble. Well, I'll stay. You two go. Get oh, Lloyd oh, Randall or somebody. Oh, do something. <laughs> Drop Jeff. Uh, paratroopers. We're being attacked. Where? What? Come on, Lloyd. They're going to land in the cow pasture over there. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Well, I'll just take a shotgun here. Yeah, and, and this watch the shells off the shelf. Up, up. Come on, sir. All right. Some Tulip's observers ran out onto the street, a shotgun, their only weapon. They jumped into a truck that was standing outside. A few other men boarded the back of the truck. They sped off down the street. When they got to the edge of the pasture, these hardy guerrilla warriors plowed their truck through a barbed wire fence, bumped across the pasture, finally coming to a sudden stop with one wheel spinning in a puddle. Lloyd, we stuck? Yeah. Oh, dear. Get out, boys. Yeah, you women stay on the truck. Oh, you be careful, Lloyd. All three of them chaps are down the ground now, boys. Oh, look. Here comes one of them now. Let me get a shell in this old shotgun. I'll show them what they're up against. Yeah, somewhere or other, I don't think they're jabs. Yes. Why, look. This man's coming is... It's white. Right. Yeah, yeah, wait. I'll call to him. Hey, hey, who are you? You better hold. I'm not going to stop and put on that fool shotgun. Well, he, he looks like one of our American soldiers. I kind of think we've made a mistake, folks. It looks okay to me. You shoot any holes in my hide and Uncle Sam will sue you. Say, what is this? Where did you fellas come from? Oh, me and my two buddies over there, we just dropped in. <laughs> we saw that. We're Army Air Corps, Gray's Field. Oh? Well, we're ground observers. Hump Tulip's post. How do you like that? We thought you fellas was Japs. We were a... Thought to let week's winner and make the award. Captain Smith. This week, the Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award is presented to the Hump Tulip's Washington Observation Post for courage, splendid morale, efficient operation, for outstanding service to the 4th Fighter Command of the Army Air Forces. We salute Hump Tulip's. Immediately at the conclusion of this program, the gold trophy will be flown by transport plane to the northwest. Tomorrow afternoon, Lieutenant Joseph Carraher, Seattle Ground Observation Officer, will formally present the handsome trophy to his observers at Hump Tulips, Washington. This is Gain Whitman bidding good night to the 150,000 aircraft warning service workers who keep 24 hour a day vigil of our home front. Good night. Next week at this hour, another thrilling human interest broadcast of Eyes Aloft. This series is written and produced by Robert L. Redd. The music is composed and conducted by Gordon Jenkins. Next week, we will switch to Portland, Oregon, for an interview with Ken Yarnstead, who is just home from China, where he served with the Flying Tigers. This is Ken Carpenter charging you to always remember... Eyes Aloft! Eyes Aloft! Watching the sky! Watching a plane flying the lane. Eyes aloft has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>